Verse says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and have courage, for to this people you should abide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may turn to do according to all the law which Moses and I serve commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night, and you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and with courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen.
Testing, testing. Okay, here's, here's how I'm going to solve this. You all on this side, look over this way. And you all on this side, look toward them and smile. Now, you can't see it, but you can know it. Now, those of you on this side, smile at them. Is that better a little bit? Because I got to tell you, when you're preaching, you're taking, fee you're taking feedback from the crowd. And when I'm looking out here, you look like a den of robbers to me. And that's not good for the Lord's house, right? It's just, just a weird, weird experience. And yet I'm going to tell you this. I mean, I met some people. I've talked to some people say, you know, until we can go without masks, I'm just not coming. And you know what? That's your liberty. You can do that. And I do understand that frustration. I just know that it's worth it to see you. It's worth it just to see you gathered together because at my house it's been great. You know, the first couple of times it was really cool, and then after that it kind of, you know, it just became too easy. It became too casual. It became just not what it's supposed to be. And so to see you, even though I'm just seeing you from the eyeballs up, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here and it makes something different. And you know what this is called when you do that is it's, it's called submission. Submission. Do I have both of these on? Correct, correct. Is that both, right on both of them? Can you hear it? Okay. I did warn you about this, uh, uh, but we're going to wait till we have a few more people all together. But I want you to be sure, if you haven't done it yet, to seek out Matthew Walton over here, who's done a lot of work to make this possible every single Sunday when it comes into your house. Lots of different things. There's a lot of weird things going on to edit that thing together. It took up whole Saturdays where his wife went off and had fun with Adeline, and he was stuck at home doing this stuff. He was doing the Lord's work while she was just goofing off. Anyway, so as he had to do that for the sake of us. And so be sure to, to compliment him on that and, and um, be appreciative of that. Wednesday night, we are going to get together summer, uh, Wednesday summer series. Steve Norris, who preaches for the Robinson and Center Church in Conway, is going to be here. I realize there's not going to be a lot of people. We don't have kids' classes. But we're going to just going to, we're going to, the same rules that apply here on Sunday morning, the same things that we're observing, we're going to observe on Wednesday night. And we'll just have a few people here probably, and he's going to speak like normal. We're going to record it and, and put it online for people who might want a midweek uh, study of some kind. It's going to kick us off on the fruit of the Spirit for this summer. We didn't want to cancel that. The young people already at work, our interns are already here, and the ladies did a service project. If you did not see it on your way up here, See it on your way out, six foot behind the person in front of you. It is sidewalk art. You're going to see it over there. You can do hopscotch if you want to. But just look at the stuff they wrote on the sidewalk. It does something for you just to see that as you're walking up here, and I'm grateful for that. We are in Joshua chapter 1. If you'll turn to Joshua chapter 1. Jesus loves me. Let me hear you. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Commandments are funny things, especially God's. The Apostle Paul noted that when a command was given, it often incited disobedience in him. Just tell you, just somebody tell you something you should not do, and it's what you want to do, and it's all you can think about. And then there are other commands that are given that are almost, it just seems impossible to fulfill. When he says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice, those are commands. You're like, if I'm not joyful, how can you command me to be joyful? Have you ever told your kids, you're going to do this and you're going to like it? If you ever tell your kids that, it's a surefire thing, they're not. Melissa has this story from when she's growing up, she hates pork chops. There's something deficient in her about that. And so she'll sit there, she sat there, and her kids, her, her parents made her sit at the table till three o'clock in the afternoon, and she never did eat that pork chop. They said, You're gonna eat this and you're gonna like it, and you can't. You can lead a kid to some experience, but you can't make them like it. And here's one that's relevant for me and for us right now God says to us over and over, Don't be 
discouraged. Another way he says it is, don't lose heart or don't let this get you down. The moments you usually say that to somebody, it's already too late. Son, I know you're down 32 to nothing in this little league baseball game, but don't let it get you down. A little late, right? So confession time. I am an optimist. I am a person with a hearty sense of humor. I like to laugh and enjoy life. I keep my distance from negative people, which if I haven't been to see you in a while. But anyway, if, and yet, if I get in some kind of weird, funky mood for a while, just leave me alone for a minute. I'm going get, to get some quiet time, and I'm going to get myself out of that because I don't like it. But this coronavirus mess is almost insurmountable. It permeates everything, and you hear it everywhere, and the, the bad news is everywhere. And that old adage that discouragement is not about what happens, it's about how you handle or your attitude about what happens, that may be true, and discouragement may be self-imposed, but I don't know that's true. Discouragement is this loss of enthusiasm, this loss of confidence in the face of circumstances around you. It's like momentum in sports. Okay, I have to explain this. Sports are when two competition teams are facing each other. You probably have forgotten that. There's things called baseball and basketball. Sports, two teams facing each other. And you've got a team that you like that you're for, and they get down and some bad things happen, and suddenly it's called momentum. It shifts. And when the momentum gets low, it self-perpetuates. It darkens you. It dampens your demeanor. You're zapped of energy. And your oomph to do anything is just suddenly evaporated. You get sloppy. You make mistakes. And things that seem like challenges around you are magnified more than they should be. And you're tempted to give up. I've experienced some of this of late. And it's harder to get out of it than it used to. Partly because of the virus. Partly because of the media. I feel like Job and my, free, my three friends are ABC, CBS, and Fox News as they keep telling me, if there's any good news, they're going to slam the door on you with some bad news, and it's frustrating. And then we have these riots, and we have this racist problem in our country, and it just piles up, and you're like, where do you go? It's discouraging. And right in the midst of a situation, much like this one probably, God keeps giving these commands, don't be discouraged, don't be discouraged. How can we not? And just by Him commanding it almost makes you impossible to muster it. And yet what we know is God's commands are for our good. His commands are for our health. And when you do what God commands you and you pay attention to what He says, it guards you. God knows the battle of the Christian life, the entire thing, for your behavior and your holiness and your obedience. It all takes place between your ears, in your mind. It's the power of your mind. The overflow of the mind, the body acts. So guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. How do you do this? How do you guard your heart from being discouraged and getting into a slump or a funk like this? For the month of June, we're going to be talking about this because there are certain clues that God gives every time He says the word, do, the command, do not be frustrated, or do not be discouraged. And, and it's so interesting, the oldest and the most common way He tells us to be able to overcome discouragement was given very much in the first books of the Bible. It's like already at the dawn of human civilization, discouragement is a, a rampant. And so there they are about to take the promised land. And they go and they send spies, and the spies come back. These guys are giants. These guys are powerful. We're like grasshoppers. It's, there's no way we can complete this. And he says, don't be discouraged. God knew that they were discouraged, and so he said, don't be. Now, how in the world can God expect discouraged people to dig out of their discouragement? And he, he offers the same thing over and over again to, most, to both Moses and to Joshua, which has been read and will be singing in a little bit. Be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. The Lord goes with you each and every day. God seemed to think that His people should know that He's with them and that alone should be enough. That alone should sustain them. That alone should dig them out of discouragement. 
And then later on in Deuteronomy, Moses preaches his own funeral. And he says the same thing. Don't be discouraged. God's with you. Every... And then Joshua takes the helm and he's overwhelmed. How do you lead in light of the great Moses just dying? How do you take over those shoes? And God says, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. I'm with you just as I was with Moses. When Jesus is leaving the apostles and says, I'm, I'm leaving for a while, he says, you be... you don't be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled, right? Believe in God, believe also in me. He says the same thing. Paul does the same tactic with the Corinthians. We fend off discourage by, discouragement by reminding ourselves God is right here with us. And you know this is true. It's what we call doctrine. Doctrine, it's what we believe. It's the fact of the faith. Doctrine often is kept cold because people keep them as factual things like an encyclopedia in the back of your head. Here's the Christian doctrine. The doctrine of God's omnipresence. This is a Gary James word. Gary James words always have to have at least four syllables. Omnipresent. It's a big old fancy word. There's a lot of these that, that are attributes of God, but all it means is this, is that God is always present everywhere and at the same time. And we sing these songs a moment ago, we sang one that's not familiar to you, and let me tell you why we're doing it. If you'll look at your songbook, pay it number 52. I know that you don't sing this very often, and sometimes you get together and say, that's old, doesn't matter. Let me tell you, there's no new songs that convey this, but I want you to know why I call this my sending your kids off to college song, which is kind of fitting for right now. It's talking about father and friend, thy light, thy love, beaming through all the works we see. We, we, we can see you everywhere. Your glory gilds the heavens above, and all the earth is just full of you. We know you're around. But I want you to look at verse 3. Imagine you're sending your kid off to college. Imagine you're sending your kid off to college, and you've got that angst. I'm about to be an empty nester, y'all. I need help, right? I need prayers, but I need verse 3. I want you to listen to this and think of yourself as a college uh, kids, or going off to work, or going off to military. Thy children shall not faint nor fear, sustained by this delightful thought. Since thou their God art everywhere, they cannot be where thou art not. You'll never send your kids anywhere that God isn't with them. Does that matter to you? Okay, you're going to have to either nod or, you know, you're going to have to do something or grunt because the facial expressions are void, right? So it makes a huge difference. And, and God seems to think that's enough difference to fend off discouragement. But that doesn't, our, our, our doctrine doesn't do that. Our doctrine sits in the back of our heads. We got all sorts of doctrine in our head. Some of it's good for trivia. Some of it's good for arguing on, on Wednesday night Bible classes over stuff that nobody cares about any other day of the week. You know how we do that sometimes? And, and it's back here. Our, our doctrine's back here. And what God wants you to do is he wants you to move that doctrine up to the front, to the frontal lobes, and start using it. He doesn't want it to be some dry, dusty, distant facts back here that you know are true, but you're like, oh, I never use them. I break them out for Bible class, and that's about all I do. And then I pack it back in. No, he says, I want you to make the journey, the journey between back here, up here, and I want you to start using it. I want you to start reminding yourself, how is it that God keeps saying to Moses, don't be discouraged, I'm here. Why does he have to keep saying that? And then when Joshua takes over, he says, don't be discouraged, I'm here. Now this should be self-evident. This is our doctrine. We've believed this since the day we were born almost. So why does he have to keep saying what they already know? Because knowing something and knowing something are different things. The journey from the back of the mind to the forefront of the head is the longest journey. And so you must be mindful. You need to make your mind full of it, full of that doctrine, so that it flows out of your behavior. Because I'm going to tell you this, God's presence won't always be overwhelmingly obvious. God will admit to us, and he says it over and over, that there are moments you don't feel that he's present in your life at all. You live in your daily life, you don't have any awareness of him. There are days you can go that you don't even think about his presence in your life. Admit it, there are. This time period has been interesting because while we've pumped worship into your house, it's up to you whether you watch it or not. And I know many of our members who didn't watch a single one. 
And I wonder, did they go through days without even thinking of God at all? Maybe, maybe not. But it's possible to do that. There are moments when you feel his presence and they're the most wonderful moments and you can think back on them with nostalgia and you can want to get back to those moments and you'll do those things that will facilitate that feeling and that presence. But there's, for every one of those moments where I feel God so powerfully present with me, there are dozens when I don't feel him at all. Do you relate to this at all? There are moments when you won't feel him at all. He's still every bit the same with you. He's still in that same room with you. He still hasn't left you, and he's with you just as he is in those moments when you do feel him. But you have to know it. You can't just rely on your feeling. And so my daughter, who struggles with anxiety, has all her life. I make her memorize Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, a long time ago. It's written on a mirror. She's got it on a shirt. She's got it on other things. Because I'm telling her, there's going to be moments, Abby, when you won't feel it. You're just going to have to know it. You're going to have to bring God from the back of your head to the forefront. You're going to have to make yourself see Him in that room. When you're taking a test or when you're in a hospital room or when you're somewhere else, when you're facing a moment, you think, I can't do this. I'm not capable of this. You need to bring God into the present. You need to bring Him right there because you're not making God do anything. God's already told you He's there. There's not a place you can be that He's not there with you, but you have to make yourself see it and you have to make yourself know it and you need to make yourself feel it because... That's enough, but it's not. Listen, if you're ever where you don't think he is, it is the most discouraging, uh, just crazy experience of your life, but you need never feel it because he's always there. You have to pull that doctrine from back here, up here to the forefront of your mind, and you need to use it. Doctrine is to be used, not just known. It takes work to do this. It'll cause a headache. It'll make you have a fever. Oops, no, no fever. Just, it'll give you a headache. It'll give you a headache. For Moses, he has to know the words of God. I want you to see this again. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1. I think it's on the next screen. So the Lord your God, see, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors told you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. You need to trust what he says. That's one way of making God present. Why should they have known that despite how they felt about themselves, they could take the promised land? Why should they have known it? Why should they have defied the ten spies and gone with the two? Because God has been saying for generations, I'm going to give it to you. I've already fought for it. Now when you get there, I want you to know that I'm there. I don't want you to go by your feelings. I don't want you to go by what you see. I want you to go by what you know. We need to do the same thing. Let me give you just one example of this. You may know where it says, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Anybody know where, that says, where it says that? Anybody give me a verse? God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but he will always provide you a way out. Anybody know where that is? 1 Corinthians. Okay, it's a big book. Chapter 10, okay, so we got some people, know, but, but really, it doesn't matter whether you know where it is. How many of you know that's a promise? How many knew that? How many have no idea? How many are smiling? No, I, I, you, you look at, here's the thing, that's a promise, that's a truth, okay? So here you are, you're feeling, you're feeling the attack of temptation, you, you're overwhelmed, the feelings within and the stuff that's without. You're sitting there going, there's no way I can resist this. I'm just going to fail to this because I can't overcome this. Is that true? Is it true that you can't overcome this? No, there's a verse, y'all, but the verse is back here. And I memorized it for lads to leaders five years ago. I don't care about that. Have you moved it up here? Have you moved it to the forefront so that when the pressure gets on and you're like, I don't think I can resist this. Oh, yes, I can. God's right here and he's provided me a escape hatch. Let me look around for it. Let me look around for it. He's here. I know. Not because I feel his presence, but because I know his word. If you know his word, you can call it up at any moment. Second time we see this is with Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life, Joshua, as I was with Moses. Look back in your recent past, Joshua. Look back at your past. How have I led you up to this point? 
What have I done for you so far? Let's start enumerating. What have I done for you, Joshua? What have I done for you? What were some things he did? Speak it out. What are some things he did for Moses? Now, this is where you speak. Don't worry about spitting. You got a mask. What? Gave them food in the wilderness. What else did Moses do? Come on, y'all. Gave them water from a rock. What else? Led them out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, all sorts of amazing things. I want you to remember that in the past so that you'll know and expect it in the present. If you don't look back at your life and reflect like Joshua, was, God told him to, and say, do you see where God's provision has been for your life all along? Do you think he's going to abandon you now? I can't ask you to say, tell me what happened in your life that's God. I can't do that here like we can with Moses recorded in Scripture. But I can firmly say this. I know everyone in here has experienced the providence of God and you can recall it and it shapes your life. And if he's done that in the past, you can trust him to do it in the present. God's with you through the past. There's a third thing and I want you to, to think about this. Psalm 46 verse 11, verse 10 and 11. Here's the thing about Psalm 46. He says, you know, the earth is shaking. The mountains are falling into the sea. It's mountains and quaking. The world is turned upside down. Sounds a little bit like right now. And so he says, in all of this, at the end he says, be still. In all this ruckus and all this turmoil, take time to be still and know that I am God. Now you've been isolated and you've been slowed down in our culture. Things have really slowed down, but I bet you this, the fact that you are forced to slow down does not mean that you've been still. It does not mean that you've taken advantage of this. I'm going to be still for a while and I'm going to remind myself and I'm going to let God remind me he's in, control, he's in charge of this whole thing. I'm going to let God do that for me. I think this verse is chronologically important. If you don't be still, you won't know. If you're running around trying to take charge of your life, you're running around trying to do everything possible, you're, trying to, you're running around being God, you'll never be still and know that you ain't. You'll never be able to be still and trust somebody else is running the universe. And he's right there with you the whole time. And so you've got to be still. What difference will it make? Two people real quick and we're done. One is Job. Here's Job, totally confused about what's happening to him. His whole world has been just obliterated. And he's sitting there in the ashes. And his three terrible, useless friends are there giving all sorts of bad advice. Where's God in all this? And he starts asking God some provocative questions, trying to figure out where's God now? What's he doing here? Why isn't he just, a, why isn't he explaining himself? And God never does until God finally shows up. He reprimands those three friends. We know he's been there all along because he starts quoting the three friends and he starts telling the three friends where they were wrong. He was listening to their 24 hour news network and he says, I hate your reporting. This is terrible. God was there all along. But at the end of Job, does Job have any more insight into what God was doing than he did when he was in the middle of the mess? The answer is no. He doesn't know any more why this happened to him than he did at the beginning or in the middle. He doesn't know anything. And yet everything is better. Everything is resolved for him. Now I've seen God and he's, he's faithfully serving God with great joy again. Why is it? Because, because here's the deal. He learned that God was present and that's enough. He doesn't have to give me answers. He doesn't have to provide great deliverance and immediate rescue. He just ha I just have to know God's with me, and that will be enough. Mary and Martha, send word to Jesus. Lazarus is dying. Plenty of time for him to get there and fix this. He doesn't. He sits on his hands and lets the inevitable happen. He dies. He finally does get back there. And Mary and Martha both have the same question. Where in the world were you? If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Jesus never answers them. Never gives an explanation. 
And he doesn't immediately raise him either. He sits there with them and he weeps with them and he watches and he sees the power of death and what it does to people. And then he goes and he raises Lazarus. So he arrives and then he, he raises. And it, but in between, he's just there weeping with her. Where we live right now is between Jesus arriving and Jesus coming back to raise the dead. That's where we live. And he's not going to rescue and he's not going to deliver. He's not going to explain everything. But I promise you this. He says the whole time I'm there weeping with you. He says it this way in the Great Commission. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That should be enough. Tim Keller puts it this way. I want you to see this quote. Suffering is unbearable if you aren't certain God is with you and for you. Ah, oh, but he is. Christians know this. We sang this at the beginning. Jesus loves me. This I know. What's the next line? Because I feel his presence so. No, it's not what it says. Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. God is always with you. The Bible tells you so. So move it from back here to up here. Know that He's with you and know that He is for you. It won't answer every question. It won't deliver you from every dilemma, but it will bring comfort, and it is enough. It is enough. God said it would be. Job showed it would be, and for us it is. What we need today, church, is to be told, don't be discouraged by all this stuff. God is with us wherever we are. If you're in need of any response, if, of any attention this morning, any spiritual attention at all in your life for struggling through whatever or handling your sin, if you want to forever be through with the discouragement of sin and its separation, we can dissolve that separation today. Not us, but God through the waters of baptism. But if you're discouraged, we will remind you in our presence, in our face, in our words, God is with you wherever you go. And I promise you, no matter what's going on, that's going to be enough. If you need to respond, make it known as we stand and as we sing.
should not perish but have everlasting life. God's great love for the world should be on our minds at this time. If you go to Romans chapter 5, starting with verse 6, it says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us regardless of what we did or who we were, the situations we were in. His love went that far. He said in verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, why should we shall be saved by his life. More than anything else, God's love for us is such that he wants us to be with him for eternity. He wants us to enjoy his presence and his love here on this earth, but he wants us more than anything to be with him after this world. And he did the only thing for us that could be done to make that possible in sending his son. And his love for us and Christ's love for us made that all possible. When you look at John chapter 15, in verse 13, it says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In this life, we have seen examples of heroism. We've seen people who would give their life for our fellow soldiers, for our nation, for firefighters, and things of that nature. We see people that have done that, and they're willing to do that. But Christ gave his love for all people. He gave, those, he gave it for those who are considered his friends. He gave it for those who are considered his enemies also. And God's love is always there. Not only does God love us that much and Christ love us that much, but he goes a step further in verse 12. It says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. It's our commitment to him to, to love others also and try to do it as he would love us. And so as we, this morning, partake of the communion together, I want you to think about the, the love that that God showed the great love that Christ had to dying on the cross and, and what's expected of us as we partake of this and accept that gift that he freely gave. Would you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the state that you've given us. Father, we thank you for the great love that you show each and every day for us. Father, help us not only to appreciate that and Put that into our lives and think about it daily. But Father, help us extend that to others. Help us to realize that only your love is, is what saves us. That 
without your love and without that sacrifice that none of us would have an opportunity to pass this world. Father, as we thank you for the love that was shown on that cross, we, we thank you for Christ's body, which was hung on that cross for our sins. And Father, we ask that you bless this bread that we partake, which represents his body, and help us to do this pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name. gracious Father in heaven. <clears throat> we continue to ask your blessing on the fruit of the vine which we're about to partake of. Father, we, we know that it represents the blood of Christ that was shed for our sin. Father, help us to partake of this pleasing in your sight. Father, help us to be committed to showing your love to others every day of our lives. Father, help us to do this pleasing for you in Christ's name. And at this time, we will uh, have one more prayer and, uh, about the contribution, and then we will uh, go ahead and finish and be dismissed. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we, we think about the great gifts that you've given to us. Father, we have all been so blessed. And Father, we are so thankful that you have been with us in, in this time and continue to be with us in this time of uncertainty. Father, we're thankful that this congregation is so blessed and that you have uh, been with each and every family and father some are struggling more than others but overall we have just been completely uh, shown your love father we ask that you uh, help us to concentrate daily uh, and sometime on the things that you do for us on a daily basis father we are totally in your care we are totally dependent upon you you do so much for us, Father, as we think about that and think about our obligations to you. Father, we ask that you bless the contributions that have been made for this congregation, the ones that are being made today. Father, we, we pray that as we do that, we will uh, realize that it's a token of what you've actually bestowed upon us and that we are to give back as we possible. Father, uh, again, we thank you for all you do for us in Christ's name.